At the approach of evening, a heavy fog arose, making the navigation of the timber rafts a difficulty in the big river. The mountainous shores were completely veiled from sight, as were even the lights in the cottage windows of Liverpool. Big raindrops pattered, waves washed over the rafts, and the logs creaked and slapped in the uncertain current. So the first question here is, what is the setting of the story? And multiple answers are possible here, so let's have you pause the video, uh, reread this if you need to, take your time, and let me know what you think the setting of the story is. Okay, so basically, this is a really pivotal skill to understand for reading comprehension, mainly for fiction, but this is also can be important for nonfiction as well. And you might get a question that asks you point blank, what is the setting of the story? That is fair game, and those questions do come up. But more importantly, whenever you're reading a fiction passage, it's a really good habit to train yourself to think, what is the setting of the story? Where is the story taking place and when? Now, the author doesn't always just tell you where the story is taking place, and they don't always tell you when. Sometimes it might be given to you right away in the passage. Sometimes it might be given to you later in the passage. Or sometimes they kind of leave it up to you to fill in the blank, and they don't make it clear. But when the time's ticking down on the test, it's stressful and, you know, it can be hard to read when you're given a time pressure. So I'd like to send you in there with a strategy rather than just kind of just uh, leaving everything up to chance. And part of that strategy involves, as you start reading, ask yourself, where is the story taking place and when is it taking place? And again, we're doing this because you might get a question that asks you point blank, what is the setting? But more importantly, it's going to help you comprehend and understand the story better, which will in turn help you get more questions right and hopefully get a higher score so you can get the test behind you and start moving ahead. So with that being said, let's move ahead now with the answer. So the answer here is shortly before evening on a big river in Liverpool. You might not have, obviously, probably you didn't get exactly the same wording that I've worded it here, but as long as you realize it's Liverpool, it's Liverpool on some kind of big river, and shortly before evening, then, you know, as long as you're thinking along those lines, I would say that you got the question right. Okay, so the next question here is, which of the following is false? A, B, C, or D? So I'll let you pause the video, and you can read the answer choices, take your time, and then... When you're ready, you can unpause the video and we'll go over this question here. So process of elimination, I would say, is, is the key strategy to getting this question right. And process of elimination is going to be your bread and butter. It's going to help you make your money on, your, on the whole GED test for many questions, especially on the RLA section. Um, and really, basically, what we have to see here is that it tells us in the passage that the shores are mountainous, right? It tells us in the second sentence, I believe, the mountainous shores, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it also tells us in the last sentence about the raindrops, right? It says, uh, big raindrops pattern. So just from that, we know that C and D are right. The shores are described as mountainous, and the weather conditions can be described as rainy. So C and D are correct, which means that uh, we're looking for what's false, uh, so C and D would be ruled out here. Uh, so now, what about B? Well, whenever you see a situation like this on your test where you've got two answer choices that both can't be correct, as we see in A and B, one of them is probably the correct answer. So if you're really pressed for time, but you see a scenario like this where you've got something where the two answer choices are almost, they're, they're very similar, but there's like, you know, a couple words that are different between them, you know that they can't both be right, so if you have to guess, I would say guess one of those two answer choices. Now, obviously, I don't want to send you into your test guessing. I would, I would much rather you, you know, be able to reason your way through the questions and get them right. But uh, you know, that's just a little tip here if you have to guess. Um, but basically, in this case, it tells us that there's a heavy fog, and that the lights were veiled from sight, meaning hidden or at least not completely visible. So. A is false, and since A is false, A is the correct answer here because it's asking which of the following is false. Now, just another tip, if you're taking notes, I would write this down and, and make sure that you drill this into your brain. On the test, please, 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 please make sure that you read the question several times, especially when it says which of the following is false. 
if it asks which of the following is true or which of the following is false, just stop, you know, think twice, make sure that you're clear that it, if it's asking you which of the following is false or which of the following is true. I know right now when we're practicing and, you know, hopefully you're in a, uh, you know, calm environment right now while you're practicing, but, you know, it's it's a whole different ball game on that test when the time's ticking down and you've just got a lot of things on the line as far as the test goes and just really moving forward and getting the test done so you can actually get on to whatever you have coming next after the GED. Um, and so just please keep that in mind. Always try to clarify which of the following is false and just think twice because it's really a shame to get questions wrong just because, you know, you, you read the question too fast during the stress of a test. So just something to keep in mind. All right, so the passage goes on to say, the steersmen hit their watch lights and called aloud their warnings to prevent collisions and vainly looked about for places of refuge until morning. Okay, so your question here, the word refuge most likely means which of the following? Is it A, a place of safety or shelter? B, a type of boat? C, a road in a city, or D, a baseball field. So pause the video, take all the time that you need, there's no rush here, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so really what I want you to see here is that we need to consider the part of the passage, uh, and this part of the passage, and also what we know from earlier in the passage, and if we do that, we hopefully understand here that they're on some kind of raft in the river, and they can hardly see to the point where they're screaming warnings to avoid hitting. So under these circumstances, it would make the most sense that they'd be looking for uh, a safer uh, place, a place of safety or shelter. So A is the correct answer here. So hopefully you got that right. So let me just show, yep, I've highlighted A here to show you that that is the right answer. Okay, so it keeps going. On a raft of spars bounded for Marietta were two brothers. Jacob and Richie Vale, who, although they had been rivermen all their lives, were a trifle apprehensive on this occasion. The current and fog had forced them close to shore, and as they beat around for a comfortable eddy, they noticed a big building loom out through the darkness on a neck of land which ran out into the river. Though this they steered, made fast, and abandoned the raft for the night. Okay. Here's the question. Please name the characters who were introduced in this part of the passage. So I'd like you to pause the video and do that now. And let me just explain before I just, you know, so we understand why we're doing this here. You know, you're probably not going to get a question on your test that asks you something as simple as name the characters. That, that's not the point here. The point, not all of these questions are meant to be exactly like the ones on your test. I have other videos that do that. This is all about the process of getting more questions right and the process of having a strategy. So as we've already said, it's important to go into your test and, you know, as you're reading the passage, ask yourself, what is the setting? All right, the first thing you always want to look for is where's the story taking place and when, if it's told to you. And then the next thing you want to do is keep track of the characters, right? That's a, a major part. Those are two of the main sticking points that I think give people a lot of trouble from what I've seen when it comes to reading comprehension is not having a clear mental picture of where the story is taking place and then just not keeping track of who the characters are, having trouble picturing the characters, or just generally not being clear about, you know, who is in the story. So that's why I'm having you do this. Uh, I know this, for some people, I know everyone watching this will be at different levels. I know this might seem simple, but it's really about sticking this point into your head because I'm telling you it's a whole different ball game on the test when you know, you've know you got that stress of the time ticking down. And I want you to, when you're in there and that time's ticking down, to remember to you know slow down and just think, where's the story taking place and who are the characters? So here those characters are Jacob and Richie Vale. All right, hopefully that was simple enough. Okay, in one to three sentences, how would you summarize what's happened in the passage so far? So there's not really a right or wrong answer here. Now, if you are, you've got paper nearby, it'd be a good idea to write this out, but you don't have to, you can do it in your head too if you want. But I would just like you to practice here summarizing what's happened in the passage so far. So. You know, imagine that you were reading this on your own for some reason. I don't know why that would be, but just say you were. And your friend asked you, hey, what happened so far? How would you explain that to them? So 
this is what I would say. I would say there are two brothers riding on a raft on a river when the conditions become dangerous. So they stop at a big building for the night. So obviously I'm it would be I'd be shocked if you have exactly the same sentence written down, but as long as you have something along these lines, I'm sure that you're you're thinking uh, the right way here. And so uh, just to keep explaining, you know, why this is so important that we're doing this is, you know, restating things in your own words and summarizing, that's a proven way to improve your reading comprehension. So it's a good idea from time to time when you're reading on the test or just in general in life to pause every now and then and ask yourself, do I understand what I just read? And, you know, a good test of if you're understanding it is, you know, can you explain the main ideas of what's happening in your own words? And so, you know, it's up to you to make that call on the test if it's going to be worth your time to pause and, uh, you know, restate what's happening in your own words inside of your head. But it, the more that you do that, it, it is going to help you get a better score. It's going to take a little longer, uh, you know, but it's going to help you get a better score. And, you know, it's up to you to make that call if you want to do that or not. But what we've done so far, we've you know, you're going in with a strategy now. You're going to look for what is the setting, who are the characters, and I want you to get in the habit of asking yourself, do you understand what's happening? The way you can, you know, figure that out, if you really understand it or not, is could I explain what's happened so far in a couple sentences in my own words? So just something to think about here. Okay, so as soon as my computer, uh, okay, there we go, here we go. No lights shone in the barred windows of this house, but nevertheless, the brothers knocked at the door. To their surprise, it was instantly opened by a young woman, who, as she stood there shading the candle with her hand, produced an impression on them which they never forgot. Of medium height, with straight black hair and pallid face, she had one pale eye while the other was brown. Her countenance was, withal, peculiarly attractive. When she heard their predicament, she invited them in, explaining that her house was a raftsman's tavern. Okay, which of the following is true? A. The young woman was tall. B. Each of the young woman's eyes was a different shade of color. C. The young woman took the raftsman to return to the raft for the told the raftsman to return to the raft for the night. Or D. The young woman took a long time to open the door. So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so basically here, uh, again, process of elimination takes us through this. So what about A, the young woman was tall? Well, it tells us right in the passage that she was medium height. Since the question is asking us which of the following is true, we can take A out because A is false. All right, so what about B? Well, it tells us that when she heard their predicament, she invited them in. So the young woman told the raftsman to return to the raft for the night is false. So actually, that's, that has to do with C, not B. So take C out. Okay, and then also, the young woman took a long time to open the door. Is that true or is that false? Well, it tells us up here that, to their surprise, it was instantly opened by a young woman. Instantly is the opposite of taking a long time. So D is, is out as well here. And that leaves us with B. Each of the young woman's eyes were a different shade of color. Okay, question. Why do you think the author included the details about the woman's eye color? There are no right or wrong answers. What I want you to get in the habit of is, I just, just want you to understand that, you know, the more that you process the text, the more that you think critically and ask questions while you're reading, whether or not you actually find the answer to those questions, the more it's going to help you comprehend what you're reading. And the better you comprehend what you're reading, hopefully you're going to get more questions right because of that, because the questions are testing you on your reading comprehension. So logically, if you comprehend better, you know, you're going to be able to get more questions right, get a better score, get a better score faster, hopefully, and move ahead. Um, so while well, you pause the video, think about that, and then I'll, well, later in the video, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit more about the eye color thing, but I just wanted to, uh, you to do some critical thinking here and just think about it. Okay. So let's keep going here. It says, Richie, who was somewhat of a ladies' man, inquired if she had a male companion in the blank, to which the young woman replied she had been alone since her husband died two years since. After supper, Rick Jacob was feeling very tired, asked to be shown his room, while Richie declared he would like to keep company with the young woman by the fireside. Okay, so the question here is, which word best fits in the blank above? A, bookshelf, B, enterprise, C, sneaker, 
or D, peanut butter jar. So I'll have you pause the video, try this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, so an enterprise is a business and she's running a tavern where she lives. So if you didn't know what the word enterprise meant, at least hopefully you knew what a bookshelf, a sneaker, and a peanut butter jar were. And if you did, you would know that those words don't fit at all in the blank, which would leave you with enterprise. So just another plug here for process of elimination as a strategy on the test. It really is a good idea to do that, especially when if you find words that you don't know what they mean, look for words that you do know what they mean and rule them out. Okay, the room in which Jacob was domiciled, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, for the night was of a large size. And the one chair, washstand, and long-legged bed speed, diminutive in comparison. There was no loft above, and the square-hued rafters and arched roof uh, through which the rain leaked was like the hay mow of a barn rather than a bedroom. Okay, question. What is the best inference we can make from the first sentence? So pause your video, pause the video if you'd like to, and look at A, B, C, or D. Think about this, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so an inference is just an educated guess, and you're going to have to make an inference based off of what you know about the text and also uh, your own experience and just common sense. And a lot of people have trouble with this, and, you know, on the test, the some of the questions are going to not be as obvious as these. I think that some of the questions on the test are actually very confusing um, from what I've seen from actual practice tests, which is unfortunate, but the, the techniques that we're learning here in this video will still help you regardless. Uh, so basically, just what I want you to think about here is that if we restate the first sentence in our own words, it's basically telling us that the chair, washstand, and bed were very small compared to how big the room was. So from this the best inference or educated guess is that the room had a lot of empty space, B. Okay, so let's look at the last question now. Question, which type, or I'm sorry, let's look at the last sentence now. Question, which type of figurative language is the highlighted portion in the last sentence an example of? A, simile, B, metaphor, or C, personification. So let's have you pause the video. Try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so I'm sure there's at least one person watching this right now who has no idea what a simile metaphor or personification is. And if, if that's you, you're definitely not alone. I could promise you that. A lot of people probably don't know this off the top of their head, at least. Um, you might get a question on your test that asks you point blank, you know, is this an example of a simile metaphor or personification? You might get a question similar to this on your test. So let's, let's go over what you need to know to get something like this right. And basically, there are three types of figurative, well, there's more than three, but the three main types to know are metaphors, similes, and personification. Now, know that a simile compares two things using like or as. Life is like a box of chocolates, right? Life is, in the, that's a famous quote. Hopefully, you know what movie that's from. If you've seen that movie, and you know, if not, uh, don't worry about it, but a lot of people, it's a really famous movie. Life is like a box of chocolates. Um, so a metaphor compares two things without using like or as. So just keep these two things in mind, metaphor versus a simile. So if I were to say life is a box of chocolates, wait, is the quote, now I'm confused. Does it say, is, is the quote, is life is like a box of chocolates or is it life is like a box of chocolate? Is it chocolates or chocolate? I can't remember now actually, but it's from the movie Forrest Gump. Um, I can't remember which, what the quote is, but basically... Um, if I were to say life is life is a box of chocolates, that would be a metaphor. If I were to say life is like a box of chocolate, that would be a simile. All right. With that being said, let's talk about personification. Personification would be giving a human characteristic to something that's not human. So an example off the top of my head would be, you know, the box of chocolate was screaming my name. The box of chocolate was drawing me in. Something like that, you know, giving a uh, human characteristic to a box of chocolate. All right, so let me drive this home even further. This is my cat, Tommy. He is featured in many of my videos here. I haven't, I don't think I've put him in a video in a while, but here's some photos. These actually are photos from a couple of years ago now, but he looks basically exactly the same. And if I were to say Tommy slept in bed like a baby, note the word like. That would be an example of a simile. Okay, 
there we go. My computer was a little slow. If I were to say Tommy is a lion when he plays with his toy, that would be an example of a metaphor. We're comparing Tommy to a lion, uh, and we're not using like or as. Now, if I were to say the couch cried out for Tommy to scratch it, that would be an example of personification, and that's also one of his favorite excuses for why the couch is scratched up, and we've pretty much decided we can't have any nice furniture ever again. Okay, so the take-home message here is that the answer to that question is a simile. Was like the haymow of a barn rather than a bedroom? That is using like, uh, and it's comparing a piece of a barn, uh, and so it's using the word like, so we would say that that is a simile. Okay, the woman handled him her can handed him her the woman handled I think that's supposed to say the woman handed him her candle said goodnight and as he undressed he could hear the buzz of her conversation with Richie. He blew out the candle and climbed into the long legged bed and covered himself with two or three patchwork quilts in preparation for the much needed sleep. But in less than five minutes was rudely disturbed. Blank, one quilt, then the second, then the third, was pulled from him by unseen hands and thrown in a heap in the furthermost corner of the room. He looked up, thinking that it was some joke of Richie's, but could see no one. Okay. Here we go. Which word most likely fits in the blank above? A. Richie's. B. The woman's. C. First. Or D. After. So pause the video. Try your best to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so what I'm looking here uh, for you to see is first, and this is just like a sequence here in the text. First, then second, then third. Um, so hopefully you got that right, and if not, then at least you tried here. It's, it's all about the process right now and the learning. On the test, of course, it's about getting questions right, but right now it's all about the learning process. Okay. He jumped from the bed, got the comforters, and recovered himself, only to have them seized again. A third time, he regained his coverings and held on to them with his stoutest grip, but was powerless to prevent their removal. He ran over to the washstand and groped about for matches to light his candle, but there were none to be found. Question. Which of the following is false? A. Richie's grip was strong enough to hold on to the covers. B. The covers were ripped off three times. C. It was light in the room during the encounter, or D. None of the above are false. So you know the drill if you made it this far into the video. Uh, you can pause the video, take all the time you need on this, and then when you're ready, we'll keep going. Okay, the answer here is C, and we can see it here in the last sentence. He ran over to the washstand and groped about for matches to light his candle, but there were none to be found. So there were none to be found. Uh, implying that there was no light. Okay. As he started for the door to call for help, unseen hands hurled him across the room where he struck the wall with a terrific thud. The more he struggled, the more he was forced against the wall as if held there by a hurricane. His clothes were thrown from the chair and lay in disorder on the floor, and in his helplessness his watch was lifted from under the pillow and he could hear the crystal shatter as it smashed against the rafters. His cries for help brought Richie and the woman to the door, but they were unable to open it, although there was no key in the lock. Question. Select the correct order of events in the text above. A, B, C, or D. So pause the video now, take your time with this, and then we'll go over it. Okay. So selecting the correct order of events questions do come up on the GED test. Uh, so really, you know, you just have to kind of just take your time, think, and reason your way through them, trying your best. But basically, we see that B is correct here, and I've just highlighted what happens first, second, and third, you know, up in the passage. So uh, take your time reviewing this if you had trouble with this question. Okay, the story goes on to say, They hammered and banged on the door while poor Jacob was held tight by his invisible tormentor. Suddenly the door flew open, Richie and his companion were hurled upon the floor, Jacob fell in a limp mass, and the comforters whisked across the room and readjusted themselves upon the bed. Richie's lantern was extinguished in the excitement, but all hands found their way to the stairs and fled from the bewitched apartment. Question, which of the following is most likely true? 
Why or why not? A. Richie didn't believe that Jacob encountered a ghost. Or B. Richie did believe that Jacob encountered a ghost. So pause the video, think about this one, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so I would say B. Richie believed that Jacob encountered a ghost, and this is based on the fact that Richie was hurled to the floor and fled from the apartment. Um, Richie experienced the encounter with the ghost as well, so he obviously is going to believe it. Okay. Once downstairs, the woman tried her utmost to coax the raftsmen to remain, promising them better quarters, but they cursed the tavern and its devilish occupants, and in the uncertain haze of dawn, hurried to the water's edge and loosened the raft from its moorings. Question, why do you think the woman wanted them to stay? There's no right or wrong answers here. Um, I'd just like you to think about this, practice thinking critically here, uh, and then we'll go on. Okay, so there's some possibilities here, right? So the most uh, rationalistic possibility is that she's just simply lonely and wants company, or she's just trying to show good hospitality. They didn't like their quarters. They had a problem with it. She's trying to offer them another place to stay. She's either lonely or just being nice, or maybe she's sinister. Maybe she knows the tavern is haunted and wants to trap them there. Could be. Don't know. Okay. At their next stop, they met a gang of raftsmen who laughed then informed of the awful, when informed of the awful night's experience. Why, that's the haunted tavern, they explained. That woman's husband and two raftsmen were murdered in that room at a dance two years ago. And from that time, there's been some hellish happenings in that big room under the roof, and it's pretty certain that one night is all you'll want to spend in it. The unsavory reputation of the log tavern spread to the entire rafting fraternity, and the odd-eyed young woman was forced to abandon the premises for lack of custom. For a number of years, the structure was unoccupied and latterly was used for a cow stable until the 89 flood carried it away. Okay, so this is uh, a critical thinking practice here, and I want you to think about what you know from the story. Really think about all the evidence, think of everything you've learned in the story, and I want you to answer this question, right? Is there a villain in the story? What do you think? Please consider what you know about the characters. The woman, Richie, Jacob, the main three characters in the story. Okay, is there a villain here? There's no right or wrong answer. I just want you to practice critical thinking. I just want to know what you think about this here. Okay, so a couple possibilities here. So one possibility is that the woman is the villain, right? So let's think about the evidence for that. Well, for one thing, she tried to get Jacob and Richie to stay after they clearly encountered a ghost. So maybe she was sinister, maybe she was evil, maybe she was a witch, you know, I don't know. Um, we also know that her husband and the others were murdered, but she still lives there. So who murdered them? I don't know. Maybe the author meant for it to be implied that maybe the woman killed them or something. I don't know. Um, but it's possible that the woman is the villain here. And... I think one of the main keys that this could be a possibility is that, uh, you know, she had one pale eye and the other was brown. And so I didn't actually know this, but apparently there's an old superstition that having different colored eyes is associated with witchcraft. And I actually Googled this and I, I read a little bit about it. I actually never heard this before. Um, so I think that, you know, the woman uh, might be uh, possibly a witch in the story, possibly like, you know, a bad character. I don't know. Um, but it also, right, the woman might also not be the villain. She, she, after all, she's a widow here. She lost her husband. Her husband was murdered. Other people died in the house. So the woman, you know, we could also spin this around and we could argue the opposite. We could argue, hey, she's a, she's a widow, you know, uh, and feel bad for her and what she's gone through. And, you know, maybe she doesn't think the house is haunted. Maybe she, uh, you know, just saw, okay, here I have two people willing to spend the night. I'm lonely. I need some company. Um, you know, and maybe the house is haunted, but she doesn't know it, or, you know, I don't know. We don't know. Maybe she has two eyes that are different colors because of a medical condition, and maybe it has nothing to do with witchcraft. I don't know. It's not clear. Okay, so another possibility here is that Richie is the villain. So why would Richie be the villain? Well, think about this number one, all right? He wanted to pursue a widow, and I'm just going to say romantically, keep this G-rated here, um... Let's say he wanted to pursue a widow romantically, and that really should be put in quotes, um, without seeming to give any thought to her well-being. And, and what I mean by this is, you know, 
Um, it's one thing if, okay, the woman suffered a tragedy. She, she lost her husband, but, you know, she's ready to move forward and start a new relationship. But that's, we have no, are not given any information that that was the case here, right? Um, you know, Richie seems, you know, like he cares more about himself. Um, he doesn't really care about the woman's well-being. As soon as she says that she's a widow, he's kind of like, oh, great. And, you know, he wants to go after her and pursue her. Doesn't really give a lot of thought to her well-being. Doesn't, as far as we can tell, isn't that concerned about whether she is still mourning for her husband. You know, we don't know. Um, so Richie might be kind of a bad guy because of that. Now, another a piece of evidence that Richie could be the villain is that yeah, he left Jacob by himself, right? So he uh, abandoned his friend. Given Jacob was tired, Jacob wanted to go to sleep, and, and Richie wanted to stay up and, and pursue the wi the widow romantically. And I'm going to put that in quotes, romantically. Let's keep it G-rated here. Um, and Richie wanted to pursue that woman. And so, I don't know, maybe... It's, you know, Jacob, you could make an argument that Richie's a bad guy because he left Jacob by himself in a strange place, you know, to uh, go after a, a widow. And also another idea here is maybe it's even the husband's ghost was the one trying to scare them out. So maybe, uh, you know, Richie was here going after the guy's wife after the guy's died, dead, and maybe the ghost started chasing Jacob out and then chased Richie out, you know, to keep them away from his widow. I don't know. You know, I'm going out on a limb here. I'm just kind of thinking of different possibilities, just kind of brainstorming because, you know, we're all, we are thinking about the text on a deeper level here because it's not clear. Who the heck knows? But I hope this video was helpful and somewhat entertaining to watch. So I wish you the best of luck on your test.